Support for Louisiana, the state we're in, is provided by... Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. go back to the Fifth Circuit or another court and say, will you please order EPA to comply? Louisiana refineries top the list of the worst water polluters in the country. I don't believe that public safety concerns are going to impact the, the passion that people have for Mardi Gras. Extra precautions will be taken to ensure a safer carnival season. Dale Brown ruffled some feathers, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, people have been gunning for him for years. The Dale Brown Court at the LSU PMAC may have a new name. When we get all the markers up, we're hoping to develop a trailhead. Louisiana's contributions to the civil rights movement immortalized with a trail. A bill to alleviate the skyrocketing cost of homeowners assurance in Louisiana is advancing to the final stages. All week, a special session of the legislature has met. Yeah, they sure have. Insurance Commissioner Jim Donilon has been leading this effort, and lawmakers pitched a bill for a $45 million relief fund uh, as an incentive for insurance companies. That legislation uh, advanced to the Senate floor. They're expecting a decision before the end of the day. And lawmakers are calling it a Band-Aid solution. Yeah. It's already passed the House 90 to 8. That's right. And now other news making headlines around our state. Lafayette is putting an end to late night Mardi Gras festivities. A city ordinance was just passed requiring bars to close at midnight on Fat Tuesday. The new rule was a collaborative effort between the Guillory administration and the Lafayette Police Department. Both say it's a step forward for public safety and may give taxpayers a break. The police department says more officers are on duty working overtime during Mardi Gras. Closing bars may reduce the money spent. Another Louisiana legend has earned their place in the College Baseball Hall of Fame. Coach Roger Cador was inducted after years of coaching the Southern Jaguars from 1984 to 2017. February 3rd is now dubbed Coach Roger Cador Day in the capital city. New talent will lead the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. After 17 years, Carlos Miguel Prieto is stepping down. Matthew Kramer is set to take his place in mid-September. Kramer comes to Louisiana from Indiana, where he was the music director of the orchestra, Indiana. He's worked with big stars like Idina Menzel, and he says he's ecstatic to join the New Orleans cultural fabric. Potential poisoning of the ecosystem for decades. Of the top 10 worst refineries in America for toxic wastewater discharge, eight of them are in Louisiana. The Environmental Integrity Project did the study and they released the findings. Marathon Petroleum in Garyville ranks fourth and Phillips 66 in Lake Charles seventh for the release of nickel. Exxon Mobil in Baton Rouge ranks 10th. I talked with the EIP Executive Director, Eric Schaefer. What are the top reasons that you're having these findings which are not acceptable? That's, that's an excellent question. That was the question. We, that was the second question, really, we wanted to answer. You know, the first was, what's in this um, stew of wastewater? And the second was, uh, how are they regulated or limited, if at all? And we found most of them aren't. EPA wrote some industry-wide standards, as the Clean Water Act requires they do, that applied to refineries way back in the early 1980s. You have to think back to Ronald Reagan's first term. <laughs> and 
the standards were set based on what was considered to be the best wastewater treatment methods available at that time. Um, but even then, they only apply to a handful of pollutants. How often are the mechanical aspects, the things that make these things run, how often are they updated? Once every five years, you can uh, you are required as EPA to look at whether wastewater treatment methods have moved forward and to tighten the limits if they have. And we're now 40 years past these standards. And EPA hasn't done that once. And this isn't the only industry where that's a problem. What kind of blowback are you getting from the companies themselves who are listed? We're hearing uh, so far anyway from Exxon in Illinois, we're in compliance with the law. Yeah. And, you know, my reaction to that is, yeah, you know, it's pretty easy to comply with standards that are 40 years old right. and that don't apply to 90% of the pollutants that you discharge. That's that's a pretty low bar. And that's not really the question we looked at. We do have some information about violations at refineries, but we say in the report, there are so few limits for this very large industry that the question really isn't, are they complying or not? It's where are the standards? Where's Waldo? How is there, at some point, somebody doing something and saying enough is enough, let's take care of this? EPA, I think, has a responsibility to pick these, these old standards up and bring them up to date. If they don't, they can be sued, and people can go back to the Fifth Circuit or another court and say, will you please order EPA to comply and get these standards up to date? And again, our thanks to Eric Schaefer for that interview. Rename Dale Brown Court. A statement I received from Governor John Bell Edwards indicates that's the plan. What are we talking about here? To discuss it, I bring in Jim Inkster, who is the president of Louisiana Network, and also Trent Andrews, who is the head of Acadian House Publishing, and so much more. Let me just first ask you, the court was named in an official ceremony in the Kentucky game last year. Why a renaming, Jim? Well, th this goes back to the old axiom that uh, the passions are so high in academia because the stakes are so low, and on the surface it's a trivial matter, but for Coach Brown and for those who have followed him, it's a, it's a big a big matter. He has not been honored in 26 years after being the greatest basketball coach and perhaps the most revered coach all time at LSU. The godfather of LSU basketball. No doubt about yeah. it. When he arrived, there was one black player in the history of the school five <clears throat> years later an all-black starting lineup. He went to two Final Fours, won four SEC titles in the conference during the regular season. And so Gunner, many records to mention yeah. also. Second winning as coach in SEC history after Adolph Rock. That is right, and he beat Kentucky 18 times. Right. Sue Gunner was a great lady and a good coach, but in 22 years never won an SEC regular season title and never coached in a Final Four. And she has already been honored with a bust at the Assembly Center, and some are asking why. And some have surmised that maybe this is an effort to give LSU the look of being progressive in a time in which it's about to go to court, being charged mm -hmm. uh, with harassment and mistreatment of women who exactly. worked at the university and were students there. And by the way, you both have already written articles about right. this. You have an upcoming book that will come out against Dale Brown, about Dale Brown, about his um, legacy. So your thoughts on this? The <clears throat> movement that is afoot to change the name of Dale Brown Court to maybe Brown Gunter Court um, <clears throat> is motivated, as far as I can tell, as a as a reporter and as a writer, by President Tate's um, program for inclusion, diversity, and civil rights. He figures, as does his followers, that by having the, the woman's name too, it would balance it. However, what he's not realizing, and this is huge is that Dale Brown is one of the foremost civil rights leaders in the history exactly. of Louisiana. The, the Board of Supervisors was explicit, clear, and loud. We are, they voted no yes. to add Sue Gunter's name to the court. Coach Brown, in short, 
completely changed the complexion of LSU basketball and what it was, what it was thought of, and what it became. It became a household name. It became a year in and year out contender for the NCAA tournament and potential national title. That had never happened before. It's never happened since either. And the question is, why has it taken 26 years to honor him? Right. And when he finally does get honored, uh, 12 board members who voted to name it the Dale Brown Court most of them will have to switch their votes and right, will so look rather foolish by doing so in order to name it the Gunter Brown Court or the Brown Gunter Court. Have you ever seen a court that was named <clears throat> unnamed unless something horrific happened with that person whose name was on the court? No, this is uh, not a, a matter of scandal. It's a matter of convenience. And uh, Dale Brown was basically asked to come to a restaurant here in Baton Rouge on his 87th birthday to meet with President Tate. And President Tate informed him that he had basically changed his mind, that he thought Sue Gunner's name should be on the court with his. And Coach Brown, of course, didn't react well. And now we're headed for a February 10th meeting unless something changes. Of the which Board of this, Supervisors. And, the, and which this will come up for a vote. Next week. So let's talk about what else is going on behind this. Who, where, where's the governor? Why does he fit into this? Uh, one of his uh, mentors, if you will, was a, a great man, Buddy Leach, a former congressman who's the father of, of Mary Warner. So he has great reverence for the Leach family. And they have been extremely benevolent toward LSU through the years, and they have been honored, as they should be. And help with their money for that the is governor right. to be elected. And, and Mary <laughs> Warner is a, a worthy adversary because she has, uh, uh, through t her tenacity and resilience, she has uh, gotten this before the board again, and unless something changes, uh, she may win this battle, but it, this right. is at the expense of Dale Brown, and he's the last person who should be a sacrificial lamb. And he but, will not play part in any of this, by the way. There have been monies uh, even proposed mm -hmm. to pay for this, and even that has been said, it's not quite enough. I have a brief story to tell you also about <laughs> our family. My father, Al Morrow, who equaled the world record several times and was a top hurdler in the world in the 1930s, later arguably the best track coach in college uh, during his tenure at LSU, where he won eight SEC championships in 15 years. Several years back, uh, LSU's athletic director brought our family together for a meeting saying we would love for Bernie Moore Stadium to be named Al Morrow Track at Bernie <coughs> Moore Stadium. This was a big orchestrated meeting, right. and he concluded the sentence for a price of $2.5 million. Our family looked at him, said thank you very much, we walked out. That was the end of that matter. So money is often a precedent in this, but in this case, money is not part of this, it seems. Well, and because Dale Brown brought winning basketball to LSU, no money changed hands and it shouldn't have. Skip Bertman brought winning baseball to LSU and we have Skip Bertman feel right. no money changed hands. On merit based. On merit. It's mm -hmm. appropriate it's, as it would be with my father. Yes. Uh, Jim, yes. some final thoughts on this as we are a week away from the board <coughs> meeting and possibly doing something. Well, Dale Brown ruffled some feathers and uh, there's no doubt that uh, people have been gunning for him for years and, and this is an opportunity to get some retribution for those who don't like him. But most people love him and revere him and for good reason. He had 160 players. 114 have graduated, and many of them from some of the most impoverished areas of this country. Many from across the world came to play for Dale Brown, and he led the basketball program to heights it's never seen before or since. Right. He had 255 sellouts in his 25 years. Sue Gunner had one in her 22 years. So there is no comparison as far as their coaching abilities. And then you and I were at LSU in the late 70s Absolutely. and early 80s. We saw it in the, in the heyday, and there was nothing like it. The fans were so plentiful that they had an overflow at the Jim Armory. To All the time. Them. John Bell Edwards is a good man, and I think he's been a solid governor. He went to West Point. Mary Warner did not go to LSU. They were not here when you and I were here. They don't have the appreciation, in my view, of others who were there and saw it and felt it and know what a contribution not only from a games and losses, wins and losses perspective Dale Brown had, but also from a social perspective. We will see. Thank you so much for talking about this. Thank you. Thank you.
Prey schedules have been in flux since the beginning of the pandemic in 2020. Now New Orleans City officials say it's time to return to traditional parade routes, but some fear the recent surges in car break-ins and violence could make this carnival season a dangerous one. Walter Leger with New Orleans and Company shares their plans to foster a safe Mardi Gras season. All right, well, obviously, hospitality is a really big part of New Orleans, and one of the biggest <clears throat> hospitality events is Mardi Gras. Do you know how many tourists that event pulls in? We know that roughly a million people a year celebrate Mardi Gras with us here in New Orleans over the course of the whole season. Um, of course, those, uh, those numbers swell on some of the bigger uh, parade days, that final weekend and into Mardi Gras Day itself. Uh, but it is a major economic impact for our city and for our state. Um, and it's part of uh, it's part of what defines the city of New Orleans and the minds of people all over the all over the world. Are you expecting the same number of tourists coming in this year? Because we've got we've we've had COVID, we've got a long you know recovery period in between that. Do you expect the same numbers? So we know that uh, numbers were a little bit lower last year than they were in previous years. Certainly, um, it, it's been a recovery period for us in a lot of different ways. So. It's hard to know exactly, but it does seem like the excitement has returned and, and we're expecting to see a, a, a big crowd once again, um, certainly visitors from other parts of the country, but also we know that, that families gather from our region uh, to, to celebrate New Orleans here in the city and we're expecting to have pretty large crowds. We're prepared for it and, and ready. So there are a lot of people that are excited for Mardi Gras. I'm one of them that haven't been in years, but there's also another side that's a little concerned because crime mm -hmm. in New Orleans has spiked. Is that a concern for tourists coming in celebrating Carnival this year? Well, you know, I mean, we work with cities all over the country um, and, and other destinations that are competing for business against the city of New Orleans. And one thing that we recognize is that there are challenges with public safety across the country. Our city is not immune to those challenges. Um, and so we're not, um, we are not alone when I think people are taking additional, uh, giving additional thought and taking additional precautions when they travel these days. Um, but I don't believe that public safety concerns are gonna impact the, the passion that people have for Mardi Gras and the, and the desire to come together with family and friends and celebrate. Um, I think that we, um, as usual, have, uh, we've, we've worked with and partnered with the city as they talk about things that they need to do in order to, to continue to put on the biggest quote unquote free show on earth um, that the people in New Orleans put on for, uh, for the world. Um, and so we're very confident in, as usual with the excellent work that our, um, that our city does to be prepared for complex events like Mardi Gras and to deliver on those so that people can have a good time and be safe doing it. The city of New Orleans is fortunate this year uh, that we're able to partner with sheriff's departments around the state to provide additional support to NOPD to ensure that there's uh, sufficient um, officers on the street as the parades return to their historic parade routes. Um, as, and and um, that will only lend additional, uh, I think, comfort and also um, belief that everything can, can be pulled off in the way that we've always pulled it off, which is you know, a lot of fun and, and safe for, for our families and, and friends and, and visitors to, to gather. And for the people that don't know, why weren't the parades on their traditional routes? Yeah, so um, last year, as we were kind of emerging from COVID, um, the, uh, the city of New Orleans restricted some of the uh, routes in order to ensure that there was sufficient uh, police officer coverage and other um, city services were able to be provided. Um, trash collection and other things associated with hosting major complex events like this one, um, we're able to go forward. And so I think it's a, a very positive sign that we're able to return to our traditional route, which is a little bit longer than they were last year. Um, it will allow people to spread out a little more along the parade route. And um, with the assistance of, of sheriff's departments around the state, um, support and supporting NOPD and ensuring that they can uh, adequately uh, accomplish the mission. All right, so the goal is really just to make sure that everything is back to normal, everybody has a good time. Are there any other preparations besides bringing in additional law enforcement just to make sure that everybody's safe? Well, you know, I mean, I think the law enforcement presence is one thing. I think there's some uh, interesting efforts that the city's undertaken, and we're doing it in partnership with them this year um, to improve the uh, quality of the experience along the parade route. It's called Recycle Dat. It's a sustainable Mardi Gras push where there's going to be efforts to collect uh, bead debris, as well as aluminum cans and other recyclable materials along the parade route. Um, our building here is actually uh, gonna be a hub for the collection of those materials and then the recycling of them. 
you know, in years past, uh, Mardi Gras was uh, measured, uh, the success of Mardi Gras was measured by how much garbage was collected. And so the idea that we can shift our focus to, to really trying to be as sustainable as we can be and, and undertaking recycling efforts, I think it's another move by the city and, and us and other partners across the community um, to just improve the experience and, and, and allow the people of the city to, to um, assist in that effort as they participate in, uh, in Mardi Gras. All right, well, thank you so much. I thank appreciate you. it. Louisiana has had many contributions to the civil rights movement, and now markers across the state teach visitors about the brave men and women who sacrificed their safety to secure a better future. The Office of Tourism Civil Rights Trail is expanding, and here to talk about that with me is Sharon Calcote with Louisiana Byways. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, so thank you so much for inviting me. Of course. So let's talk about the Civil Rights Trail and how this got started. You've been with it since its infancy. How did it get going? The Lieutenant Governor attended a meeting in Phoenix and Alabama was talking about their civil rights trail and Mississippi was talking about their civil rights trail. And he asked the Assistant Secretary of Tourism, does Louisiana have one? And the answer was no. So January 2019, he pulled together a meeting in his office and we had his uh, African-American studies experts, we had historians, we had different groups um, and people with the Office of Tourism and Historic Preservation, and we discussed the development of a civil rights trail. From that, um, we held 22 meetings around the state. We traveled 3,000 miles across the state, and these meetings were to gather information on civil rights trail history that we were not aware of because when we started this there was no folder anywhere that said here's Louisiana's civil rights history so this is all organic and it was all from the grassroots up and of course we're learning now that Louisiana has contributed a lot to the civil rights movement how many markers are up currently there are eight markers up right now and they mostly are designating nationally significant sites because what people don't know is that Louisiana was a leader in the nation of civil rights movements. Uh, Louis Baton Rouge had the, the first bus boycott. You know, ULL was a university that desegregated almost before the decision of Brown versus the Board of Education. The four little girls that desegregated the New Orleans school system was the first in the South. And that was Ruby Bridges, Leona Tate, Gail Etienne, and Tessie Prevost. So, right. I mean, there's so much that we contributed nationally. And of course, I believe Ruby Bridges was the last civil rights marker that you guys just put up, the, most, the latest yes, one. the latest one at William France Elementary. So how do you pick which sites are gonna go into this trail? Okay, all sites are nominated from the public. And on the Louisiana Civil Rights Trail, uh, www.louisianacivilrightstrail.com, there is a button that you can push and the nomination form comes up. And you can fill out that information and then it comes directly to me when you press submit. But to figure out what sites as far as markers and uh, those types of things, we have a panel of African-American historians and scholars that are helping us make those decisions. So currently there are eight of these markers up. Is there a goal, a specific number you guys are trying to reach? For this first round, and I say first round because as more information becomes available, this is a dynamic trail, so it's going to continue to grow. Uh, we have 15 planned. 15 planned. Mm -hmm. and Across the state. Whenever you say you want this to continue to grow, are there any other directions that this civil rights trail could go in? Is there anything unique that we can expect? Well, we're gonna keep adding to the website. We've done the preliminary website. Now we need to start adding more stories. And um, we've thought about more green book locations. We've thought about more stories about experiences that people had to make it um, more interesting. 
And of course, all of this is just in the very beginning stages. Yes. And we know a lot about the Green Book here. So if that happens, I'd be very excited. Oh, that'd be great. <laughs> but people can go to www.LouisianaCivilRightsTrail.com. They can look at the website. One of the things that came out of our 22 meetings is the stories needed to be told in the voice of the people that experienced it. So I think you will find that on the trail. Ours is a little different from mm -hmm. others. Right, and most of the information that you really want to find is on the website. It is. Right, because there's nothing like hearing those voices directly from the people that experienced it. We interviewed Leona Tate um, a year ago whenever McDonough 19 was added to the, the mm -hmm. trail because she was one of the little girls that desegregated it. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, there's nothing like actually hearing it directly from her. Right, and when we put the uh, trail together, we have archived videos, we have archived photographs, we have newspaper articles that when you click a site, you can scroll down and there'll be icons and people can learn more even about what they're reading on the trail. Okay, so you bring you know all of this information with you and that's how you experience the trail. Right now, yes. And when we get all the markers up, we're hoping to develop a trailhead. All right, well, is there anything else people should know about this amazing thing Louisiana is doing? They just need to stay tuned because it's going to continue to grow. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, it's that time of the year again, and we're excited about it. LPB is accepting nominations for high school students to be recognized as Louisiana's Young Heroes. And we do this program every year and it's always really exciting to meet these young people. They truly are yes. exceptional. And as you know, I mean, a young hero is someone that's excelled academically, who's inspired others through their deeds and strength of character, given significantly of themselves through public service. And they've also overcome adversity. Yeah, absolutely. Th these are the best of the best. Yes, and they've all done extraordinary things. The deadline for entries is Wednesday, March 1st. Educators, family members, and friends are encouraged to nominate so visit lpb.org slash heroes to learn more and to submit a nomination online. Can't wait to see who yeah, we're going to no. have. Fantastic. And everyone, that's our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are with our LPB PBS app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Morrow. And I'm Kara St. Cyr. Until next time, that's the state we're in. Every day, I go to work for Entergy. I know customers are counting on me. So Entergy is investing millions of dollars to keep the lights on and installing new technology to prevent outages before they happen. Together. 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 We power life. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.